The Seattle music scene is renowned for its legendary contributions to rock history, from Hendrix to Hart, uh, from Duff McKagan to Queensryche, as well as grunge era outfits Soundgarden, Nirvana, and Alice in Chains, and modern rock mainstays like Foo Fighters. The Emerald City has a lengthy roster of great artists. Today, we're all about a Seattle-born band whose genesis is almost passed into myth. Their breakout rock anthem dispelled a devastating curse that had haunted its lead singer for years. From catastrophe to catharsis, son, have I got a little story for you, next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. I'll tell you what, if you wanna be a part of a premier music community that curates the best of the rock and roll era through interviews, stories, and history, subscribe below right now. Make sure to click the bell so you never miss out. I think you'll dig it. Uh, we also have a Patreon that you're gonna to wanna to check out. There you'll find additional catalog of exclusive content can even become an honorary producer on some of these episodes to help us curate this music history. I'm really excited to return to uh, another one of my favorite shows we do on here. Uh, it's called Breakthrough. In this show, we break down songs, albums, or events that kicked open the door to an artist or band's career and uh, gave them that momentum to rocket to long-term success. Uh, previous episodes have included The Joker by the Steve Miller Band, uh, Boys Don't Cry by The Cure and Named by The Goo Goo Dolls. Today, we are tracing Seattle's musical lineage back into the 80s and diving deep into the inception of Pearl Jam's groundbreaking smash, Alive. The roots of Pearl Jam stretched deep into the Seattle subterranean rock culture of the early 1980s. Before grunge became a mainstream stereotype or was even named, a musical ethos were growing around bands like Malfunction, Soundgarden, Green River, Skin Yard, the Melvins, and the U-Men, who all contributed to a 1986 compilation album that was called Deep Six. The cluster of bands were the rumblings of the tsunami that flooded the Seattle musical landscape in the early 90s. In 1987, Malfunction frontman Andrew Wood Join Jeff Ament and Stone Gossard from Green River and Greg Gilmore from Skin Yard to form Lords of the Wasteland, the name of which references the lyrics of God of Thunder from Kiss's 1976 album Destroyer, as many of you probably know. I'm the Lord of the Wastelands. Lords was a short lived cover experiment that evolved into Mother Love Bone. Andy Wood, a beloved icon in Seattle, believed that he was born to be a rock star, and he was right. I mean, he overflowed with natural charisma, talent, showmanship, and he spellbound audiences across the Pacific Northwest. Those who saw him perform sensed that they were, uh, they were witnessing the origin story of a Seattle superhero. One of these days, I will do a video just on Andrew Wood, who is one of my favorite front men. He would have been, I think he would have been one of the greats. In 1988, Mother Love Bone signed with Polygram Records and released a six song EP, Shine. The record sold well and their notoriety increased. They were one of Seattle's uh, most promising bands. Now in late 1989, they returned to the studio to work on their debut album, Apple. However, in March 1990, just days before its release, Andrew Wood overdosed on heroin. He was found face down in a bed with a used needle close by. He was rushed to a nearby hospital. He was placed on life support. Uh, the doctors declared him brain dead and it was clear that he wasn't going to recover. So they let him go. He was only 24 years old. Now news of Andy's death shook the Seattle rock community, uh, adored by all that knew him. He had been at the center of the emerging scene. If Wood had lived, we might be talking about Mother Love Bone in the same breath as Nirvana. And for my money, no Seattle band wrote a better song than Chloe Dance or Crown of Thorns. Just a masterpiece. And this my kind of love. But for the remaining Mother Love Bone Brotherhood, the pain was too acute to stay together. Uh, each member dealt with the grief by working on individual projects. Stone Gossard, Love Bones, a guitarist, teamed up with a childhood friend and fellow guitarist Mike McCready. Uh, for a series of jam sessions, 
After some time had passed, they invited Mother Love Bone bassist Jeff Amen to join them. In 1990, the trio wrote a five instrumental collection titled Stone Gosford Demos. Uh, these songs later evolved into Pearl Jam's Alive. Uh, there was Once, Footsteps, Alone, and Black. But for now, the guys just needed a lead singer and a drummer. Gosford and his bandmates invited former Red Hot Chili Peppers drummer Jack Irons to join up. Though he wasn't available, he did agree to pass along uh, copies of the demos to other musicians. Now, Iron said he knew a guy in San Diego that might be a good fit. That guy turned out to be Eddie Vedder. Uh, Eddie Vedder, who was 25 years old, he'd recently parted ways with a new wave alternative band called Bad Radio. But when Jack met up with Eddie, he told him the story of Andy Wood's tragic passing and about how Stone and Jeff were forming a new band. A meeting was arranged and Vedder got his hands on a copy of the demo. Uh, in a story that has now passed on into legend, Vetter listened to the demo over and over uh, during his graveyard shift at a petroleum warehouse. Uh, when he finished his shift, Eddie passed on sleeping and said he went to surfing at Pacific Beach to mull over what he had just heard. Eddie didn't catch many waves that foggy California morning, apparently, but uh, sleep deprivation and inspiration coalesced to form lyrics in his mind. And so it was, the semi-autobiographical song Alive uh, began to take form. Now, when Eddie returned home, he got out his mixer and he laid down the vocals with uh, no blank cassette on hand. He actually recorded over a copy of, get this, Merle Haggard's greatest hits. He mailed the tape to Jeff. Uh, up in Seattle, Jeff listened to the tape uh, three times. He couldn't believe what he heard. He called Stone and told him to come over and to hear it for himself. Stone would later say, we were blown. He was really the first that had it. We had a few other tapes of singers, but it was always people singing uh, Mother Love Bone songs, trying to be just like Andy. When we heard Eddie's tape, it was like, here's a guy who really didn't know anything about Mother Love Bone for the most part. He didn't have any preconceived notions about what it was. In short, it was astonishing. I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. The glasses I'm wearing right now, uh, when you get your eyewear at zenny.com, you're never going to have to deal with things like foggy lenses or glare with Zenny's advanced 2-in-1 anti-fog and anti-reflective coating. It's really amazing. If you go to zenny.com, you can design your own pair today and add those features. The guys picked up local drummer Dave Cruzen and arranged to have Eddie meet them in Seattle. Vetter took a week off work and uh, day one, launched into a grueling set of 10-hour rehearsals. More extended days piled up after that, and uh, on day five, they laid down the tracks for an official demo. It was the first time any of us had felt so strongly about creating music as a band. That's what Jeff Amen said. He also said, we love the song we were making together and could sense its potential. At one point, someone jokingly stuck a, a Mookie Blaylock card into one of their cassette cases for a would-be cover. So on a whim, the guys uh, named the initiated band after the NBA player. They'd just be Mookie Blaylock, you know, until they figured out something better. On day six, Mookie Blaylock played their first gig featuring future 10 tracks, Release, Alive, Once, Even Flow, and Black, some of the greatest ever. Notables in the crowd included the members of Soundgarden. There was Nancy Wilson of Heart, uh, Mother Love Bones manager Kelly Curtis, and Seattle Mariners pitching ace Randy Johnson. Everyone was nervous, wanting to see the Phoenix rise. That's what Soundgarden manager Suvin Silver said. She said there was such an intense connection between all of them. This was the first time. A lot of fans saw Eddie Vedder, and the feeling was, the audience was like, who is this guy? Is he good enough to fill Andy's shoes? But it felt like the place wholeheartedly accepted him. 
Eddie was on his way to converting Seattle. Now, on day seven, Mookie Blaylock recorded their official demo at London Bridge Studios, and Eddie Vedder actually flew back to San Diego uh, to get back to his job. Now, from November 1990 to February 1991, Mookie Blaylock stayed busy. Uh, Eddie joined the band, and they played venues from Vancouver, B.C. to San Diego, California, to support Alice in Chains at that time. They also collaborated with Soundgarden's Chris Cornell on a tribute album to honor Andy Wood. They called the one-off Seattle supergroup Temple of the Dog, as many of you know. Uh, we'll do something on Temple of the Dog for sure. Uh, that album, uh, they did that in 15 days during November and December 1990, and that was in Seattle. It would be released in April of 91, but then it was re-released in 92 to widespread acclaim. Mookie Blaylock officially played its last show on March 8, 1991. The placeholder name had really run its course and the band had been kicking around ideas for a while on a new band name. Now they all liked the word Pearl, but uh, they needed more. And they actually found the rest of it at a Neil Young concert. During Young's set, Jeff Ament marveled how each of his songs seemed to stretch into epic improvisational jams. Jam, he thought. Turning to Stone, he said, what about Pearl Jam? Mookie was out and Pearl Jam was in. Now, Pearl Jam recorded 10 in the spring of 1991 at the familiar location of Seattle's London Bridge Studios. Uh, Jeff and Stone selected Rick Parshar to produce and engineer. He had overseen uh, the recording of Temple of the Dogs album, and it was a positive experience. Uh, 10, man, it's such a great album. It's certainly indebted to a host of classic rock influencers like Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, The Who. Now you know you are a cute little heartbreaker. Parshar's addition of old school 70s rock elements, uh, Fender Rhodes piano, organ, extra percussion, and the reverb layering of Mike and Stone's dual guitar onslaught proved to be defining in the creation of Ten's overall sound. As for the songs themselves, Ten focused on a myriad of dark subjects, depression, suicide, loneliness, abuse, homelessness, and murder. Part of its appeal to Generation X, my generation, was uh, its ability to speak without reservation to uh, subjects that were often swept under the rug by our parents or teachers and other social institutions. In 10, uh, young listeners heard a, a candid voice about difficult topics that were relevant to our experiences. 10's evocative lyrics also left a, a lasting mark in no small part because of Eddie's impassioned vocal delivery. Eddie Vedder, he just possesses a highly distinctive timbre, such a power. It instinctively gels with the album's rich sound. Ten came together really in a watershed moment. For the better part of a decade, band members had honed their craft and uh, broadened their experiences they crisscrossed you know, through the Seattle scene. Reflecting on the making of Ten, Eddie Vedder said, no one really compromised toward each other at all. It was kind of a phenomenon in a way. We'd all played music for six, seven, eight years and been in different bands. And we were feeling something we'd never really felt before with the honesty and the way it was all coming out. Ten is just a chock full of tracks that send you staggering in disbelief. Each one worthy of an in-depth examination of its own. But I wanted to uh, start first with Alive. It was the first track I ever heard from Pearl Jam and it just leveled me. Written by a guitarist, Stone Gossard, it actually originated as a Mother Love Bone track called Dollar Short. When Eddie got a hold of it, he put his own uh, twisted semi-autobiographical mark on it. Though it bears uh, similarities to Vetter's life, he has stated outright that it is a work of fiction based on reality. By no means is it a nonfiction story. It is just certain ways that I felt. Who knows why it came out at the time? I have no clue or remembrance. That's what he said. 
The story of Alive draws from uh, Eddie's painful personal revelation that the man that he thought was his father was actually his stepfather. The man that Eddie knew simply as a family friend, Edward Lewis uh, Severson, he was in fact his birth father. Uh, for the majority of Vetter's young life, he had no idea about that. It wasn't until Edward Severson died of multiple sclerosis in 1981 that Eddie actually discovered the truth. And sadly, he was stripped of the opportunity to talk to his real father uh, now that he knew who he was. Vetter was just tortured with what might have been. The news was uh, a crater blown open in his psyche and Eddie viewed his circumstances as a, a loathsome curse. His life had been a lie, and now he was condemned to suffer because of that truth. This entire experience was the ether from which the insights for Alive were captured. Uh, in the song, Vetter's teenage protagonist suffers through the same revelation. But then the story takes a distorted turn into a dark fantasy when the boy, a carbon copy lookalike of his father, becomes victim of his mother's incestuous advances. She said, I'm ready. Actually, the words, I'm still alive, at first seemed to be a resilient declaration to keep uh, pressing forward through the pain. But in their original context, they were actually a despairing lament. This young protagonist did not want to stay alive, and yet he was. Speaking to the song's meaning, Eddie Vedder has said, everybody writes about it like it's a life affirmation thing. I'm really glad about that. It's a great interpretation, but alive is torture. The story of the song is that a mother is with a father and the father dies. It's an intense thing because the son looks just like the father, so she wants him. The son is oblivious to it all. He doesn't know what is going on. He's still dealing, he's still growing up, he's still dealing with love, he's still dealing with the death of his father. All he knows is, I'm still alive. Those three words, that's totally out of burden, end of quote. However, as time passed and uh, Pearl Jam's audiences invested themselves in the song, it kind of rearranged itself, taking on new life and new meaning. In the original story, Eddie said, a teenager is being made aware of a shocking truth that leaves him plenty confused. It was a curse. This curse was the tormenting knowledge he received and the bitter aftermath that followed. He had to keep on living knowing his father was dead. In 2006, uh, Eddie Vedder told the audience on VH1 Storytellers that Alive has really been transformed through the years. Guy in the song was me. Fine, the dad's dead, but I'm still alive and I gotta deal with it. So it was a curse. Cut to years later and we're playing to larger and larger audiences and they're responding to the chorus uh, in a way that you never thought. Every night when I'd look out into the sea of people reacting in their own positive interpretation, it was really incredible. The audience changed the meaning of those words when they sang, I'm still alive, they were celebrating. This repeated and uh, optimistic interpretation lifted the curse for Eddie Vedder, allowing some measure of peace and healing to take root. It changed the song into a self-empowering anthem. As many artists say, and they tell me all the time, when they release the song to us as listeners, it becomes our own individual interpretation and meaning. I mean, when I first heard it, though I knew what it was about from reading up on it, uh, the chorus became a lifeline for me. You know, I was really struggling at that point, a confused teenage outcast at that moment. I mean, I wasn't getting along with my parents. Uh, I was depressed. I was dealing with bullies at school, cruel upperclassmen. I just felt lost and unheard. So the chorus was a way for me to scream out to everyone around me that I was still alive and I deserved uh, to be understood. And when it comes to the music video, it was subversive, if only for its simplicity. The video was taken actually from Pearl Jam's concert footage and filtered into black and white. The part of its appeal is that we witnessed just how riveted the audience is with the show, 
Throughout, you see instances, you know, stage diving, crowd surfing, or rafter climbing, and a high energy performance as you get your blood pumping. I mean, the video is such a far cry from the flamboyant, high production concept music videos that have been ramping up on uh, to MTV all through the 80s. And then when Pearl Jam played Unplugged, are you kidding me? When Eddie takes off his hat and shakes his hair, Sorry, I mean, I know that Nirvana was my generation's uh, Ed Sol Beatles on Ed Sullivan moment, but that was one for me, for my generation, for sure. <laughs> then when he plays Saturday Night Live and he's like climbing up on the thing, I mean, there was nobody like Eddie Vedder at that time. It was just awesome. Though Pearl Jam's momentum was initially slow, Alive was one of the key reasons for their success. It charted at number 16 in the UK, number nine in Australia. It also reached the top 20 in Belgium, Ireland, the Netherlands, and New Zealand. Now the single was available only through import in the United States, so it didn't chart on the Billboard Hot 100. Uh, however, it did peak number 16 on the Album Rock Tracks chart, and uh, it was at number 18 on the Modern Rock Tracks chart. Over the past 30 years, 10 has sold over 13 million copies in the U.S. alone and has propelled the group to superstardom. But well beyond the media hype, industry marketing, and the MTV overplay, the songs on 10 spoke directly to my generation. A generation of fans, we took that album's uh, raw emotions into our heart and our souls. Looking back, uh, Eddie Vedder has said that 10 still sounds as distinct to him as it did while Pearl Jam was making it. He said, and I quote, it was music I'd never really heard before. It wasn't so much grunge rock as it was groove rock. That early Jeff and Stone songwriting period is really about the groove. It was guitars and guitar pedals, but I had this thing about it that I hadn't really heard before. It was a different thing. To have this new framework with its own identity was really exciting. It felt like it was our own. End of quote. To us, it felt like it was our own too. <laughs> Leave us a comment about Pearl Jam and the curse killing rock anthem from Seattle. What are your memories of this song? What do you remember about 1991 and 1992 when everything was changing? I want to know in the comments. This was an exciting time in music. Now, if you dig our content, make sure to subscribe below so you never miss out on our videos. We would love to have you as part of our community. Check us out on Patreon, also our merch. Help us keep the music alive. It's paramount. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.